Welcome back to Hard Run Box. Before I get into the news, a quick heads up that our merch store is now live. I know a lot of you guys have been asking for it. We'll be talking more about that in a few days, but if you do want a shirt like this one, well, you can now get that right now. Links in the description. As far as news is concerned, look, not a super big week for hardware news this week with most of the announcements being occupied by, you know, custom Navi cards and all that. Steve has already reviewed two AIB Radeon RX 5700 XT. So if you missed those, well worth going back and checking out his thoughts on the MSI Evoke OC and the PowerColor Red Devil models. A few of the stories to emerge this week revolve around AMD once again. They have a knack of just continually appearing in the news since the launch of Ryzen 3000, which I guess is a testament to how massive that product launch was. Anyway, this first story actually isn't related to Ryzen. Rather, it's about the launch of the Radeon 600 series, which, yep, you guessed it, is another set of rebranded graphics cards. The Radeon 600 series isn't going to be something you'll be able to buy off the shelf as a discrete add-in card. Instead, it's for OEMs that are building either desktops or especially laptops and want to offer a low-end GPU. Now, the reason why these cards end up getting rebadged is that OEMs are super fickle. They want their new generation of products to have a new generation of hardware, so companies like AMD comply to refresh their lineup without actually advancing the hardware in any way. It's annoying, I personally don't like it and wish they just stuck with the original name so we don't have two products floating around out there delivering the same stuff but with different names. It's potentially misleading for customers as well if they're upgrading from an old system to a new system but are, you know, just getting a rebranded GPU. Everyone is complicit here, I think it's both AMD and the OEM's fault. Aside from that annoyance, here is the actual lineup. Nothing amazing really. The fastest product is the Radeon RX 640, which is a rebrand of the Radeon 550X. So we're getting at best 10 compute units or potentially eight in some variants. Again, that's confusing for customers. Clock speeds are pretty low. VRAM is set to either two or four gigabytes depending on the model and so on. This is a Polaris GPU, so we've seen it all before really. Then as you progress down the line, we have the Radeon 630, 625, 620, and 610, which are rebrands of the Radeon 540X, 535, 530, and 520. So with the 600 series, naming steps back one notch, so the 535 becomes the 625 and so on, but the underlying hardware is basically identical to what AMD provided in the 500 series. The Radeon 610 is actually quite interesting because that's still a first gen GCN part. Who would have guessed that AMD would still be selling first gen GCN products in 2019, an architecture that first launched in early 2012. AMD only lists the Radeon 625 and below as laptop chips, which makes sense given desktop buyers probably don't need the earth-shattering power of just six compute units given integrated graphics would offer a similar experience, or better yet, a Ryzen APU. Still, we can expect to see this lineup in new OEM products over the coming months. A possible AMD third gen Threadripper CPU has appeared on Geekbench. The chip, codenamed AMD Shark's Tooth, has 32 cores and 64 threads with a base clock of 3.6 gigahertz. The model number and so on aren't part of any existing product line from AMD, so it does seem this is a next generation CPU if it is legitimate. It's not unusual for engineering samples to show up in benchmark databases like Geekbench, but it's also not that hard to fake this sort of information, which has happened countless times in the past as well. We don't know whether this is a true leak or not. We'd be tending towards real, but unfortunately, we don't have any additional insights to share. What does seem clear, though, is AMD will be refreshing their Threadripper lineup in the near future, and the company almost certainly has engineering samples right now, especially since AMD just launched second-gen Epic CPUs, which will form the basis of Threadripper 3000 and deliver pretty impressive performance boosts. When these products will launch, we don't know for sure, although current rumors are suggesting October of this year. The benchmarks posted to Geekbench show the AMD Shark's Tooth processor paired with 128GB of memory on a prototype motherboard running Linux. It posted a multi-thread score around 20% higher than the current Threadripper 2990WX, but this is kind of meaningless since we don't know how close this configuration is to final specs. 
What we are expecting from Threadripper 3rd Gen is a performance uplift around what we saw from 2nd Gen to 3rd Gen Ryzen mainstream CPUs, plus of course all the related platform features which will be especially handy on an HEDT platform. So PCIe 4.0, better support for AVX2 and so on will really help out with those HEDT workloads. Anyway, that's something to look forward to in the coming months and this might have just been a quick little teaser for you guys. Silicon Lottery have revealed their binning statistics for Ryzen 3000 CPUs. If you're not familiar with Silicon Lottery, they're a company that buys and tests various CPUs and validates them for their overclocking capabilities. They then sell the best bin chips and best overclocking chips for a premium, guaranteeing a certain level of performance. Silicon Lottery validate using extremely stressful worst case scenario AVX2 workloads, so the frequencies they list for an all core workload may be a little lower than some users would achieve themselves using less stressful test environments, but the stats are interesting nonetheless. For a CPU like the Ryzen 9 3900X, all chips can do a 4 GHz all core AVX2 workload. If you want 4.05 GHz, that's top 87% material, and then so on up the line until we get to the top two bins. 4.15 GHz is a top 35% chips, and 4.20 GHz a top 6% chip. It's even tighter with the 8 core models, getting just an extra 100 MHz out of these chips means you have a top 20% or so CPU. But their data does seem to suggest that the Ryzen 7 3800X is better binned than the Ryzen 7 3700X. While all 3800Xs could do their AVX2 workload at 4.2 GHz, just 4.15 GHz on the 3700X is a top 21% CPU. Still, the differences in bidding between the two 8 core models isn't really large enough to justify the price difference in my opinion, we're only talking 100 to 200 MHz or so. Unfortunately, Silicon Lottery haven't tested the 6 core Ryzen 5 lineup. It definitely would have been interesting to see how those single chiplet CPUs with a few cores disabled stacked up in the binning stakes against the fully unlocked 8 core single chiplet Ryzen 7s. As for buying these products, Silicon Lottery CPUs become expensive if you want any of the decent bins. The 4.1 GHz 3900X, for example, which is just 100 MHz higher clocked than the base models and is only a top 68% bin, is being sold for $160 above the CPU's base MSRP. Want that top 6% chip? You'll need to fork out $840 US or $340 above the MSRP. So, as always, this is really meant as an enthusiast service for hardcore buyers. Not that you can even buy binned Ryzen 3000 CPUs sold through Silicon Lottery right now, they are all sold out. Couple of monitor announcements, first up is the Acer Predator XN253QX, which is another new 1080p 240Hz display that's using the latest generation of TN panels that claim to hit sub 0.5 millisecond response times. This new Acer model is 25 inches in size, sports full G-Sync technology as is the case with other Predator models, and of course comes with the usual Predator feature set like an adjustable stand. Pricing is set at £550 when it launches in the UK mid-September, so that will be at the upper end of pricing for a 1080p 240Hz. 40 hertz monitor, but that's not overly surprising given it packs a G-Sync module. Gigabyte have also quietly revealed the Aorus FI27Q, which is a minor update to the AD27QD that launched earlier this year. From looking down the spec sheet, this is basically just an AD27QD that improves its maximum refresh rate up to 165Hz, which is up from 144Hz. Same 27-inch 1440p Inalux panel, same Aorus tactical features, no word on price or launch date. And we also have similar updates from ASUS. The PG279QR takes the popular PG279Q and bumps it up to a 165Hz refresh rate, still with G-Sync, still with the high refresh 1440p IPS panel. The PG279QE is a similar product with the same performance characteristics, but with a more basic design that removes a lot of the crazy ROG design elements. Again, no info on pricing or release. And finally, in a blog post, TSMC's head of global marketing, Godfrey Cheng, has talked about how, in their opinion, Moore's law isn't dead. The most interesting thing to see here is the image of TSMC's chip on wafer on substrate technology, which is one of the ways fabs are continuing to advance the way we make chips as it gets harder to scale to smaller nodes. The picture shows the world's largest silicon interposer 
with a huge 2,500 square millimetres of available space. TSMC says this is enough for two 600 square millimetre processors plus eight HBM modules at 75 square millimetres each. This could be used for a multi-die GPU design, for example. As 2,500 square millimetres is well above the typical size available from a single die approach, this combination of multiple dies on an interposer is basically the future of these sorts of products. The blog post goes on to talk about these sorts of designs and how stacking will become a key part of improving chip density. Ching says that you could add a CPU on top of a GPU on top of an AI edge engine with layers of memory in between. Going on to say that Moore's law is not dead, there are many different paths to continue to increase density. It's an interesting read if you like to hear from those involved in the fabrication industry. Of course, TSMC isn't the only company developing stacking technology like this. Intel, for example, are also working on similar tech at their fabs because like TSMC, they've realized that stacked and multi-die approaches are the way of the future. Anyway, that's it for this week's News Corner. As always, you can subscribe to get the segment in your inbox every week and be sure to hit that bell icon so you get notified. You can now buy Hardware Unbox merch from our merch store. Links in the description below. That's a great way to support the channel directly. If not, we also have our Patreon available where you can gain access to our monthly live streams and Discord community. And I'll catch you in the next one.